together this morning to praise and worship our Lord Jesus Christ. Todd, could you lead us a word of prayer, please? Y'all join me this morning. Father, we do. We humbly come before you today. Thank you for this. Uh, another opportunity that we can come and share in the fellowship this morning and share your word, Lord. And we thank you for that. Father, Isaiah 52 7 talks about <coughs> in my words, Lord, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the ones that spread the good news, the good news of salvation and of peace, and that uh, the God of Israel does reign over our country, Lord. And we, we thank you for that. And Lord, I know that we're surrounded by a lot of people in the past, in our daily lives, that uh, sometimes I, I don't share at all, or I share in a way that's not uh, pleasing to you, Father. So today, Lord, from here on out, until uh, I stand before you, may I have that courage and the boldness to share the gospel in a way that would be uh, edifying you, Father. Uh, I know uh, that sin had a hold on me at one time, but because of the, your love and the cross, uh, I know that uh, I have that freedom, I have that salvation, and I'm heaven bound. So as we come here this morning, Lord, embolden uh, us. Uh, I would ask for opportunities, Father, but you give them to us every day. So as we uh, come here today, listen to your word, Lord, when we put it in our heart and may we act upon it, Father, that we, we can lift your name on high this day. Father, we love you and uh, we lift all those that are speaking your word today. Uh, just cover them up, Lord, fill them up to, to overflow uh, with your word, Lord. Uh, we love you and we praise you. We lift it up your precious son, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Thank you, Todd. I appreciate those prayers. I hope everybody's having a wonderful morning this morning here in Jackson, Texas. Uh, already sunny, a little bit different than it was yesterday. Hang around. It's going to be pretty. The Lord's going to give us a blessed day. But every day is the day He gave us to live in, and we're so happy that we're here in Junction. Jerry, we hope you're getting a little bit better. I know you're tired. I know you're sick. But we love you. Uh, Real quick, getting a couple of announcements, or one at least. Uh, Larry will always remind me that March 17th is the date of our starting day for the Easter patch. It'll be at the Easter grounds. It'll be Monday and Thursday night. We start at 7 o'clock. And the veterans are going to be here tomorrow, Methodist Church, okay. uh, veterans run. And uh, Todd just remind me the veterans who do the motorcycle ride that come in every day, every year, will be here tomorrow. And they'll, have, they'll be here between 4 and 5. I think they'll have a a meal for them at the Methodist Fellowship Hall after that. This is really a neat event, been going on for several years. You guys come out and support these guys. They yeah. supported us yeah. for years. It's time to give them some support also. Uh, Catherine's going to be speaking here in a little bit, but I'd kind of like to get her going a little bit, at least where the Lord has me going. Uh, I was talking with Josh earlier. It's a really amazing how you know, sometimes on a Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday night while you're sleeping or resting, the Lord is really putting a powerful message in your mind. You're just kind of like, yeah, let's go. And by Saturday or Sunday morning, you go, where was that tape recorder? Where were my notes? Where's my note at? Come on, Lord, help me out there. But uh, he's had me fairly fired up all week, and it's, it's really pretty neat. I've been reading the book of Daniel. And the way I see it, everybody looks at Daniel differently. It's a, a really a strong book of vision and prophecy and where Daniel looks to the future. The Lord shows him what's going on in the future. But the first four through five, six, seven chapters, in my opinion, are kind of where we need to be living, living as Christians today. You know, Daniel originally was taken from his home with a bunch of young people. And they brought to uh, Babylon to be taught the Babylonian way and to give up their Lord. And throughout many trials and tests, he continued to stay faithful to God. And throughout these tests and trials, his faithfulness shined back or shone back on the people that were dealing with him. The first time there was a gentleman that said, these are the foods you need to eat. He said, well, I'll tell you what, let us test these things. And we'll eat our foods. You, eat, you let the other guys eat the king's food, and we'll see who's better off at the end of a couple of weeks. And obviously, God blessed Daniel and his friends. But God also blessed the gentleman that Daniel was talking to because he took his life and his, and his risk of his life in his hands by trusting this young man versus trusting the king. Another time when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
were asked to bow down to the foreign gods. They didn't do it, but out of respect, they told the king, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to give up on our God. We're faithful to him. And through the fiery furnace, they were saved. And this was also a reflection of the people that day that, that, that again, one more time, God was faithful to those who were faithful to him. I get back to chapter 6 where it talks about Darius had come back into kingdom now after the, the hands on the wall. Uh, and Daniel had made a pretty good impression on the majority of the people in his life at that time. And so much so that the people around him were going, doing, going to try to do whatever they could do to get him out of favor of the king. So they came back with an edict that, that nobody can worship anything for 30 days. But Daniel, being faithful to God, continued his prayer life with the Lord. And upon doing so, these guys who were out to get him came back to the king and said, Hey, isn't this what you wrote? Isn't this the law? The king said, You're right. If I write it down, we say it's a done deal. And they say, Well, Daniel has been worshiping up another God, another God. And the king, knowing what he had said and done, he said, Well, we've got to do these things. But the same point I'm trying to get at is although the king recognized that he had put this in place in law, he spent the whole night trying to figure out a way to protect Daniel. I've written the law down, but he was asleep and prayed all night trying to figure a way to save Daniel's life. This is an impression that Daniel had made on a foreign king, somebody who worshipped other gods. Obviously, Daniel walked in such a way that these people respected him. And regardless of what was written down in the law of the land at that time, the king said, I've got to figure something out. Throughout the night, he prayed or laid down or didn't eat, he fasted, and couldn't figure anything out, but had to go by the law. And they went ahead and put Daniel in the lion's pit, and he sealed it. And when the, he was down there for 24 hours, the king went home again, and he fasted and did not sleep. And I guess he prayed. It didn't say that, but he said he fasted all night. And when he ran to the next day, he cried out, Daniel, are you okay? And Daniel basically, in my words, said, my, my God is taking care of me, and, and the king was pleased. But where I'm trying to get at is the fact that Daniel walked in such a way, was faithful to the Lord, the Lord was faithful to Daniel, that whoever Daniel came in contact with was blessed. And, it, and their, their attention was like, what have you got going in your life, and, and how can I get some of that? Isn't that the same thing that we're trying to do as God touches us as we continue to walk the world, we continue to take steps, we continue to go to work, we continue to live our lives instead of necessarily reading the gospel to people. The people are watching us and trying to get upon us. What have you got going in your life? How, do, how can I know your God? Look how he favors you. I need that favor. You know, the king came back and made an edict basically that everybody in this kingdom now shall fear the Lord God. She'll be in awe of the Lord God of Daniel's God. Isn't that what we should be doing as Christians? We should be walking in such a way that people truly want to have the same thing that we have. Or do we truly have what we have or what we say we have? Are we truly walking in the footsteps of Jesus Christ to the point where people want to stop us and say, what's going on in your world? Do we have that favor where people try to get our attention? Obviously, Daniel had it in such a way where people tried to get him out of the way. He's screwing things up for the rest of us. But he stayed faithful, and God was faithful to Daniel. And through his faithfulness, kingdoms were turned. And it says at the end of chapter 6, it talks about how Daniel had favor throughout the rest of his life with those kings. In other words, whatever he was able to do, God was able to work through Daniel, and they're still telling him what everything was accomplished. There was a gentleman on TV in the other night that talked about that kingdom. I think it was Cyrus. He talked about how Daniel was still in that kingdom. They, they eventually found this old scroll not too long ago. And it was from that time dated. And it was written on there by the king. And it was basically something similar to people's bills of rights and the rights of people in that time. So obviously Daniel walked in that time and he had that kind of influence on that king that he would actually write Bill of Rights for people. Isn't that amazing? All because one man was faithful to God. Think about that. We as a group of people are, are, are a body of Christ. If one man can do that, what can this so-called body do? Can his body be that faithful to God and God be that faithful to this body that we can touch so many people and continue to bear fruit for God?
That's what it's all about. Bearing fruit for God. Walking in such a way that we get people's attention that they want to have what we got. Catherine's fixing to come up here to speak, but I've got to say this because this was on my heart. I pray that everybody that goes to church today goes to church to worship God. And I pray that, number one, everybody goes to church. But I pray that when you go in there, there's a time of worship instead of just chatter and wait until 12 o'clock. I pray that you, you truly seek God today. I pray, I, as in Revelation 3, 20, it talks about how God is knocking on the door and wants to come in and worship and dine with us. I pray that somebody has their ears on today. I pray that somebody hears God's voice and lets Him in, lets Jesus in, so the Holy Spirit comes in and joins us in our true worship of the Lord. It doesn't matter whether we get out of there at 12.01 or 12.15 or 12.20 or 12.30. It's about worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. Worship and pray and help your pastors out today. Pray for them. Pray for them. Help them out. Let me get out of the way. I think I've said too much. I think Catherine does something to say. just thank you for this day. We thank you for the sunshine, Lord, and the cool air, Father, on our faces, Lord. And Father, we, we do come today to worship you, Lord. We want to worship you. That's what we're made for, Father. And so, Lord, um, we come to you today, Lord, humbled, Father, and in awe of who you are. Lord, we want more of you. We want to be closer to you, Lord. We want to sit at your feet, Lord. And we just thank you, Father, for what you did for us. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Um, <clears throat> we've been doing this uh, Bible study out at the Jesus Hall of Fame. I've spoken about it a couple of times, called the Hearts Ablaze. And uh, I've been getting together with some of my girlfriends and we've been having different discussions on it and it's really kind of beating our butts. I mean, it's it's a pretty tough Bible study what we're doing because it's basically it's, it's about us as the body of Christ um, living holy lives. And um, a lot of times we may think we're living a holy life but we're really not living a holy life. We're not living the life the way the Lord wants us to live it. And so... I've been, get, you know, been having conversations with my girlfriends, and we were talking a lot about our marriages or about our families and the way we live our lives at home. And it's interesting because, um, you know, uh, we have a lot of commonalities um, as I've gotten together to gather with them. And it's just really been on my heart uh, to pray for our marriages and to pray for our families and for the body of Christ to rise up to a level where we live holy lives because. Um, you know, time is short, and, I, and we need to do that, right, to honor the Lord. So, um, you know, I've been hearing, you always hear all the time about uh, how to have a happy marriage, how to have a happy marriage. You know, you go to the bookstores, and they have these uh, self-help aisles, and it's how to make your husband happy, how to make your wife happy, how to have a happy life. It's all, you know, about making yourself happy, which is interesting because what it what it does is it's making it selfish. It's about us, how we have to be happy, right? Well, um, the bad thing about it is, is it's not biblical. That is that is secular. That's that's all you know. Self help, I'm, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with self help books because there's some that that can be very helpful. But most of those, when they say how to have a happy marriage, it's it's secular. It's not biblical. And so, um, you know, we don't hear enough about a Christ-centered life or a Christ-centered marriage. You hear about how to ha have a happy marriage but not a Christ-centered marriage. And so all those other books and teachings, since they're not biblical, how can they be successful, right? If it's not centered around the Lord, how can it be successful? Um, I don't believe, I, I just believe they can't. So... If you love the Lord and the Lord is first in everything, then your marriage just falls under that, right? Um, today there seems to be a lot of unhappy marriages. Um, 
I mean, I've been in Junction now for uh, all, 10, 10 to 11 years, and, and a lot of my friends have gone through divorces, and it just seems that, that we're living in a time where marriage is in crisis. And um, I believe it's mainly because the, the, the marriage gets centered on the kids or it gets centered on the world and what's going on and my kids aren't doing what I want them to do. And, and so the focus gets off of the Lord and it gets on everything that's down here. And it doesn't stay on the Lord. Um, but what if you feel you have a happy marriage and then it comes to the end of your life and you realized, what did I do to please God? Right? I mean, I, I know some people that, that, are, that are Christians, but they're not really seeking after the Lord, and they feel, well, I've lived a pretty good life, and I had a happy marriage. But then you come to the end of your life, and you're, you know, you're standing there in front of the Lord, and he's going, what are you being accountable for? You know, when, when did you please the Lord in your life? Um, and, and what would that, what is that? That would just fall to the ground if you lived your life and never did anything for the Lord, right? Because it says we're supposed to preach the gospel. That, that, is, our, that is our main <clears throat> thing that we're supposed to do. So I compare that to, um, you know, saying I had a happy marriage and I lived a good life, but I really didn't do anything to the Lord. That's like the five virgins, right? Going to the wedding banquet and the three didn't have the oil and they're trying to borrow it from the other two and then they say, hey, we're going in, right? And then the others come back knocking on the door and the Lord says, sorry, too late, right? We don't want to be like that. So having a Christ-centered marriage is fulfillment. And um, being happy in your marriage from that fulfillment is just the blessing from the Lord that follows along with it. Um, I, I um, am disappointed that there are so many single people today that are going, I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to be a part of that. Uh, have you heard of single people saying, you know, they look at marriage and they go, I don't want anything to do with it, either because they've been burned or, or look at look at the um, uh, the 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 reputation, or I should say, the character of marriage that we have today. Um, uh, the reason they say they don't want to be a part of it is because they see that it's not successful, and. Uh, they say right now that the, the divorce rate in the United States is 50% and it's rising every day. So that's half of the people in the United States are divorced. And so um, it's sad. It's sad because God instituted marriage and, it, and it's, it's something that's supposed to be beautiful. He instituted it. So putting Christ first at the center, I believe, first of all, is seeing his power. Uh, knowing how powerful he is, seeing and knowing the power of God. But what's wrong with the Christian uh, church today is, is we do not recognize the power of God that's within us. And so if we don't recognize that, then in, in turn it makes us weak. And then our marriages are weak, and then our lives are weak, and then we go around depressed and moping and going, you know, oh God, help me, help me. Well, we don't realize who lives in us. And so, it, you know, and so on and so on, and it goes down the line where um, all of a sudden you realize that you're not happy in your marriage, you're not happy in your life, and, and you, you're not recognizing why. It's, it's when you have Jesus in your life and the, the power that lives in you, that's everything, is it not? It's yeah. everything. But we defeat ourselves. Um, a lot of times I think we defeat, defeat ourselves because of our past. Because a lot of people say, well, I, I never had the, the model to be a good husband, or I never had the model to be a good father. I never learned that. But um, so already we're defeating ourselves by not recognizing the power that's in us by Jesus Christ. Um, that is the Holy Spirit power. That is the resurrection power. That is the power that breaks all bondage on us. So your past... And even, even if you weren't modeled in it, that stuff can be breaking off. That's generational curses that doesn't have to continue down in the family. And so, you know, that's, I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of single people do not want to get married because of what's going on in the past. It, you know, it says that we have strength in our weakness. And that's, that's the power of Jesus. You know, as a woman, 
uh, we're so emotionally, we're emotional, are we not? <laughs> Come on guys, you know we are. And so we always, you know, when we get emotional and problems in our marriage or in our families, we go, oh, you know, I can't do this, or we're not strong enough to tackle this problem, or, you know, emo uh, the problems in our lives always seem so huge compared to that. I, and that's just because we're emotional beings. And so, you know, when we get upset and we, we and we're because we are emotional, I think you guys hear it as blah, 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 blah. <laughs> like, there they go, on and on and on, right? And so what I have to do is I have to remind myself that the very spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that very spirit, it lives and it dwells in me. I, it's like I have to remind myself that almost every day. And not even in like family matters, but in at work or whatever, I have to remind myself the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he lives and dwells in you. It's there there there's it's victory, is it not? That's victory. Um, I want to read Ephesians 3.20. This this struck me the other day and, and it, it kind of per pertains to this. It says, uh, Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Uh, because us women are so emotional, we tend to find ways to try to make things work the way we want them to work. We're like, okay, well, I can't stand being man like this anymore. And so we, we start right away rationalizing and trying to find ways to, to, to make things work. But it never works. The only way it's going to work, it says that he is able, he is able, God is able to exceed abundantly more than we could ask or imagine. So if we could just realize, give it to the Lord, get over the emotional place and keep our eyes on him. You know, that, that's successful. That's what it is, because he is able by his great power. And, and look, you guys, time is short. It, time is short. I, you know, God is bigger than our marriage. Um, you know, our main purpose, our main purpose in life is to show a dying world who Jesus Christ is. That's our main purpose. You know, and then everything else falls in place because, you know, we were, we were made to worship and we're made to preach the gospel. That's what we're supposed to do. And then all the other stuff will come. And, and, and um, it's our mission. And a happy marriage is just the blessing that comes from it. Seek ye the kingdom first. Yes? Seek yes. ye the kingdom first and everything else shall be handed to you. And I'm not saying that family isn't important and your husband isn't important, your family isn't important, but God has something bigger than that. Um, it's not a time to be depressed. It's a, it's a time to um, edify the body of Christ and encourage the, the body of Christ. Um, I know uh, somewhere in the Bible it says, uh, the world and all of its form shall pass away. I, I think it's in Corinthians, but I'm not for sure. Um, anyway, um, you know, I could be here right now talking to you, but something could happen to me tomorrow. I mean, God forbid, but um, that's why I'm saying life is too short. Uh, if I'm going to go to Jesus, uh, you know, I want to be there to say, you know what, Jesus, you were, you are first in my life, and you were first in my life. And I want him to open up that door and say, Catherine, come on into the banquet, sister. Come on down. Because, you know, I had him first in my life. It's funny, I, I heard a Bill Johnson teaching once, and he says, he goes, I always, Bill Johnson says, it always tickles me when I see people put levels like, you know, husband and wife first, then kids, then job. And he goes, he goes we, all, we all have to put everything in boxes, right, and put everything at levels. And Bill Johnson says there are no levels. He goes, if you have God first in your life, then, then the marriage falls in place, the kids falls in place, the... You know, everything turns out for the good for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's like there, there's no levels to your life. If you just have God first in your life, then it's all going to fall into place. Um, in Matthew, it says that there's no marriage in heaven. Now, some people think that's sad. I think it's awesome. <laughs> 
Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, it can be sad for some people and it's joyous for other people, but, but basically, either way, God has a different pattern for us in heaven. It's not the same as on earth. When, you know, believe me, when you're, when you're going to see God's face, I promise you, the last thing you're ever going to think about is the world or your house or uh, your job or your, your family. I mean, it, it, you're going to see his face and you're not even going to have a recollection of that. I mean, that, you know, that's, that's what the word says. And so, um, you know, Apostle Paul wanted us to get that. He wanted us to get that. I mean, if you look at, at Paul in the beginning of his letters, the, the more as it got to his last letters, he, he lost more and more of his, his own identity. He just wanted to be nothing but to be like Jesus. And, that, and, and Paul wanted us to get that. You know, he, wa he, wants, he wanted to instill in us that the, the resurrection power is in us. And so if he's in us, then... then that's who we're supposed to, that is who our identity is in. That's who it is. And, and do you get that? Do you get that that's what he was trying to do? So if we live a Christ-centered life, um, every, everything else will, will fall into place. And also it says that, that everything of this life will pass away. So, and that includes our marriage because God is bigger than our marriage, right? Because he has big things for us in heaven. Um, a lot of times, as a husband and a wife, we expect things from each other. Like, I expect my husband to, you know, take out the trash or whatever, right? But I think a lot of times as marriage goes on, we get higher expectations about each other, just like the wife, uh, husbands have higher expectations about their wives. And what happens is, is we lose focus because we're expecting so much from each other, right? And what happens? We get unfulfilled expectation because we're human. But there's one that we can expect in, and you know it's gonna be fulfilled in, and, it, and it's the king. And so um, the, the marriage is happy when we keep our eyes on God because then the expectations for the husband or for the wife seem so not important, right? It, 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 does, it makes it go away, it makes it not important, and you can enjoy each other in your marriage. Um, so do you, do you truly love God first in your life? Um, is he your first love? You know, the word says that we're to turn back to our first love. And, and we as a body of Christ have not do, done that. We're, we're still living the way we're living and the world is still going on the way it's going on. We're not living as a holy people. <clears throat> And um, I just have to share this with you, too. And, and, and um, it says we as brethren, if our brethren's living a life that they shouldn't be living, we're supposed to peg them on it, right? We're supposed to say this is what the Lord wants. And my son right now is living with his girlfriend and has for two and a half years. And I keep saying to him, well, when are you going to ask her to marry you? And he's like, well, I'm trying to save money for this or for that. I understand that. But it doesn't honor the Lord. And I, I believe that's one of the reasons why single people say, well, I don't want any part of that marriage because, you know, I've been burned or I've been there before and I don't want to do that. It's easier to live together. Well, guess what? That doesn't honor the Lord. It does not honor the Lord. That's what the Word says. And so for us to live a holy life, we want to honor the Lord. And so I'm, I'm not pointing fingers and I'm not judging. I'm just saying, um, uh, think about it. Think about it. And if your life is good and you know it's good, I told, told my son Tony, you know, Tony, look, you're, you're living a really good life. You guys are really happy. What, what's holding you back from doing it and honoring the Lord in that way? And, that, and the Lord's favor will fall upon you when you do that. And so when we see our brethren, we need to encourage them. Hey, you know, why don't you guys get married? I mean, or say, or put the idea out them. Tell them it honors the Lord. That's what we're supposed to do as, a, as our brethren. We want to do what, what, what the truth says, the truth and the word, yes? yes so I'm hopeful for my, for my son, and I'm praying for my son, and I don't harp on him about it. I, you know, I don't want to be, like I said, I don't, I'm not judgmental. I just, I just want him to do um, the right thing, uh, to be a holy, a holy body of Christ. And so, um, and what does the first commandment say? The first commandment says to love God, right? So why would he not be the center of our life? To love God first and then to love one another.
God bless you. Thank you, sister. I appreciate that. I've got two things to say. Basically, for prayer number one, Ephesians is from men. Ephesians talks about how men should love their wives as Jesus loved the church. Yes. And that's a mighty love. That's an unbelievable love. That's a good start. And number two, to my beautiful wife, whenever she talks, I promise I never, never do I hear you say blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I intend to listen to everything you say. Please join me in a word of prayer. Dear Father, thank you very much for this day. Thank you for the word that is spoken. I pray that you continue watching over us and guiding us and protecting us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. That's in the lesson today. Thank you. <laughs>